Shannon Sharp has just filed a motion to dismiss Brett Favre's defamation lawsuit against him. In this video, we'll review highlights from Sharp's new motion to dismiss and talk about what is going to happen next in that case. Before we get into the video, I want to quickly invite you to join my channel membership program to unlock special perks and to support the channel. As you may recall, Brett Favre has sued Shannon Sharp for making the following statements. The problem that I have with this situation, yep. you got to be a sorry mofo mm. to steal from the lowest of the low. Skip, Brett Favre is taken from the, 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 uh, uh, the underserved. He stole money from people that really needed that money. Yep. Favre has also brought similar defamation cases against Pat McAfee, host of the Pat McAfee Show, as well as Mississippi State Auditor Shad White for making similar comments about Favre in connection with the Mississippi welfare fraud scandal. Last month, we saw Pat McAfee drop a bombshell motion to dismiss in which he asked the court to toss out Brett Favre's claim arguing that the complaint did not contain adequate allegations of actual malice to state a defamation claim. Favre just simply filed a amended complaint in which he added additional details of actual malice to basically render Pat McAfee's motion to dismiss moot. More recently, Mississippi State Auditor Shad White filed a motion asking the court to toss out Brett Favre's defamation claim against him. Shad White argued that his statements were entitled to absolute immunity from a defamation claim because he made them in his capacity as state auditor. White also argued in the alternative that the court should dismiss Favre's lawsuit and his claims without a trial because he cannot produce any evidence of actual malice or falsity of the statements that White had made. Favre filed a fiery response in opposition to White's motion to dismiss, in which Favre accused White of wasting taxpayer money by filing a frivolous motion. That brings us to May 3rd, when Shannon Sharp filed his own motion to dismiss Brett Favre's defamation lawsuit against him. And quite frankly, it was unique and different in many ways from the other two motions filed by Pat McAfee and Shad White. So with that said, let's take a look at Shannon Sharp's motion to dismiss. So here in the introduction section, you you can see Sharp gives us a nice summary of his three main arguments for why Favre's case should be dismissed, tossed out of court. Let's take a look at it. First, Sharp's commentary challenged here is a classic example of the rhetorical hyperbole and loose figurative language entitled to full protection from liability under the First Amendment. In the context of the public welfare fraud proceedings being reported, any reasonable viewer would have understood Sharp's colorful language to reflect his subjective personal views, not literal statements of fact. In other words, he's saying that he was not actually accusing Favre of having committed a crime, but he was condemning Favre's behavior for having the air of criminality to it. And that may seem like a trivial distinction, but I think here it could mean the difference between liability versus no liability. Second, Sharp argues that Mississippi law protects his right to make caustic and critical comments on Favre's involvement in a matter of public concern, the misspending of welfare funds intended for poor Mississippi families. Each of the challenged statements unmistakably reflects Sharp's opinions based on disclosed and publicly reported information. And it was very clear if you watch the full broadcast that Sharp is not a huge fan of Brett Favre at all. In fact, I believe Sharp's brother played with Favre during their NFL careers. And Sharp has been very critical of some of Favre's outside of the field activities. Shannon, how much do you think this could tarnish Brett Favre's legacy? Well, I don't think none can tarnish it because if you go back and look at his history when he played in the NFL, it should have tarnished it already. I talked to people that was in the room when Brett Favre went to the Hall of Fame and nobody mentioned about text messages that he sent to that jet masseuse. Mm. Nobody mentioned anything about the addiction that he suffered from. But he's been a sleazeball. He's been shady for a very, very long time. Brett Favre will not be seen in any more national TV commercials from this point forward. Why, why won't? Skip, they knew about this. He's still in Copper John. He's still throwing passes to Jerry Wright. This will end that. <laughs> Whatever. Moving on to Sharp's third argument, he says that Favre failed to meet the most basic prerequisite to bringing a defamation claim. Mississippi's retraction statute and gives the statute right there. This statute requires plaintiffs to send a retraction demand 10 days before suing. 
And of course, Favre only sent his retraction demand to Shannon Sharp six days before filing the lawsuit. Those are Sharp's three main arguments. Let's dive in and take a deeper look at some of the points that Sharp is making here. Sharp's first argument I'll refer to as his hyperbolic rhetoric defense. Sharp is basically saying that as a matter of law, his rhetorical hyperbole and figurative expressions about Favre are protected speech under the First Amendment that cannot support a defamation claim. The debate on public issues should be uninhibited, robust, and wide open. Consistent with these principles, courts routinely dismiss defamation claims based on statements using figurative language and rhetorical hyperbole. Even where the statements at issue taken literally are untrue or accuse the plaintiff of a serious crime. Now, this is extremely persuasive, and Sharp goes on to offer a number of examples that are similar to his situation. So let's look at the examples that he gives us. For example, the Supreme Court has held that a defendant's use of the term blackmail to describe the plaintiff's conduct was not defamatory because, quote, even the most careless reader must have perceived that the word was no more than rhetorical hyperbole. A vigorous epithet used by those who consider the plaintiff's negotiating position extremely unreasonable. Finney cites this case right here, Horsley versus Rivera. In that case, a television host called the plaintiff an accomplice to murder, presumably on TV. Despite that fact, the court found that that was non-actionable rhetorical hyperbole, quote, expressing his disbelief that the plaintiff shared in the moral culpability for an individual's death, not as a literal assertion, that plaintiff had by his actions committed a felony. Then you have Mattel Inc., the creator of the Barbie dolls versus MCA Records. And the court held in that case that the terms bank robber, heist, crime, and theft are non-actionable rhetorical hyperbole. Then you have another example, Phantom Touring Inc. versus affiliated publications out of the First Circuit in which the court held that describing theatrical touring production as a ripoff, a fraud, was not actionable defamation, even though that could be construed as a criminal behavior, as a crime, just as Shannon Sharp has accused Favre of committing a crime. When taken literally, Sharp goes on to argue that whether Favre is a sorry mofo obviously cannot be proven true or false. I thought that was kind of humorous. And characterizing Favre's actions as stealing from the lowest of the low in the context of Favre returning over a million dollars in welfare funds money intended for the disadvantage is exactly the kind of figurative rhetoric that courts have routinely held should not be taken literally, lest we chill the uninhibited, robust, and wide open speech that the First Amendment was designed to protect and does in fact protect here. Again, very powerful argument right there. Then Sharp's second argument, which I call Sharp's opinion defense, states that the complaint that Farr filed fails to state a defamation claim because Sharp's opinions were based on a disclosed factual premise. What exactly does that mean? Well, let's take a look here. Sharp points out that statements of opinion are actionable in defamation only if they clearly and unmistakably imply the allegation of undisclosed false and defamatory facts as the basis for the opinion. In other words, I know something you don't know, and therefore I'm going to accuse Favre of being a criminal based on undisclosed facts that I can't share with you. But take my word for it, this guy is a criminal. If Sharp had said something like that, that would certainly fall into the category of defamation that is based on undisclosed false and defamatory facts, possibly. Sharp's comments about Favre's reported involvement in the welfare scheme are textbook examples of protected opinions with a disclosed factual basis, emphasis on disclosed. At the start of the broadcast, the moderator clearly and unmistakably informed viewers of the reported factual basis for Favre's involvement in the welfare scandal through explicit reference to the Mississippi Today article published the day before. Yesterday, an investigation by Mississippi Today found that Brett Favre, along with the help of a former Mississippi governor, obtained welfare funds to help build a new volleyball center at the University of Southern Mississippi. The moderator then turned the program over to Sharp and Skip Bayless, and they started to express their opinions on the reported facts. Sharp and his co-host not only expressed their opinions, including the three disputed comments at issue in Favre's lawsuit here, but also provided the underlying factual basis supporting their opinion, including Favre's own text messages. 
the state's civil lawsuit against Favre to recover misspent welfare funds and references to reporting of others, including Mississippi Today and Yahoo Sports. The Mississippi Department of Human Services had to file a civil lawsuit against Brett Favre because he had not paid back the interest he owed on the $1.1 million that he was fraudulently given right. for giving no speeches. Right. right. And to talk about what he didn't know. This is what Brett Favre take. If you were to pay me, is there any way the media can find out where it came from and how much? So if you got to ask your, if you got to ask this question, is there any way the media can find out? You already know you're doing something wrong. This is this is this well, is a joke. Yahoo Sports reports that the FBI is looking into this and has actually questioned Brett Favre already about it. And then finally, we have Sharp's third argument here: Sharp's retraction defense. And this is essentially Sharp arguing that. Under Mississippi state law, the plaintiff shall at least 10 days before instituting any such action for defamation serve notice in writing on the defendant. And then it goes on to say that Favre's failure to serve notice of retraction, demand for retraction at least 10 days prior to filing the lawsuit is grounds by itself for dismissing his lawsuit. What are my final thoughts on this case? Well, I've got a couple for you. My first final thought is that unlike in the McAfee case where Favre simply made the motion to dismiss Moot by filing an amended complaint adding additional details of actual malice, here Favre will have to file a response to this motion to dismiss because Sharp is not arguing that Favre failed to allege sufficient facts to establish each element of his defamation claim. Rather, he's making purely legal arguments. He's saying that even if we assume that everything you have said in your complaint is true, this type of speech, these statements that I made on my broadcast are legally protected from any kind of defamation action under the First Amendment. And that's essentially saying that here in America, we believe that it's more important to protect that kind of speech on a matter of public concern than it is to recognize anybody's injury that they might suffer from making statements like that to the public on a broadcast like The Undisputed Show. I think to defeat the motion, Favre is going to have to actually distinguish the cases that Sharp has cited. He is going to need to distinguish his situation, his case, from those cases, and then also offer his own set of cases similar to him that are more on point where courts actually denied a motion to dismiss. So what could possibly happen? What could be the outcome of this motion? Well, the court may grant the motion and dismiss Favre's case without prejudice. It may do this on the ground that Favre failed to give Sharp the 10-day notice period before filing the suit, the opportunity to retract the statement. However, I think in this case, that would be a complete waste of time because number one, Sharp is not backing down from his statements. I don't think he's going to retract the statement, and that's why this is ultimately a somewhat hollow argument. Had Favre given him the full 10 days, I'm sure Sharp would not have retracted the statements. He seems fairly convicted and stands by the statements that Favre, what he has done is wrong and that his speech is protected under the First Amendment. So I do not think that the court is going to dismiss Favre's case and then make him refile it after he gives a 10 day retraction period. That just seems like a waste of time to me. The second outcome that may happen here is that the court could grant the motion to dismiss, dismiss Favre's case with prejudice. And I think that is a possibility. That is a real possibility here if the judge agrees with Sharp that his statements here are in fact hyperbolic rhetoric protected by the First Amendment. And then finally, the court could deny this motion and require Sharp to file an answer. And so which of those three possible outcomes will happen here, at least in my opinion? Well, this one is simply too close to call. That said, in general, I will say most judges are reluctant to dismiss an action, a claim at this stage with prejudice. That's especially true where there is conflicting case law on the issue, which I would assume is the case here. We'll have to wait and see what Favre finds in terms of conflicting cases. If you don't want to miss any updates in this case, make sure to hit that subscribe button below and turn the bell notification icon on. And of course, as always, thank you for watching.